in February of 1959 on the slopes of a mountain in the Ural Range, later named Dyatlov Pass after the group's leader. A haunting mystery unfolded that has gripped the world's imagination ever since. A group of hikers from the Ural Polytechnic Institute embarked on a winter expedition that promised adventure and the attainment of the highest level of hiking certification. Led by Igor Dyatlov, the team of 10 was composed of young, enthusiastic students and graduates, all seasoned hikers, aiming to traverse the northern Urals and reach Ortorten Mountain. Their journey, filled with aspirations and camaraderie, turned tragic when all but one of them lost their lives under circumstances that remain baffling to this day. The incident, known as the Dyatlov Pass Incident, is characterized by strange and unexplained elements. The hiker's tent was found torn open from the inside. Their bodies were discovered at varying distances from the campsite, some with severe and unexplained injuries and others with signs of hypothermia. Despite numerous investigations and theories ranging from avalanches to military experiments and even paranormal activity, the cause of the hiker's death remains a mystery. This story, a blend of human ambition against the backdrop of nature's unforgiving power, continues to be the subject of fascination, speculation, and sorrow, embodying one of the 21st century's most enduring mysteries. The team members were not only united by their quest for adventure, but also by their desire to achieve the prestigious Grade 3 hiking certification offered by the Institute a recognition that marked the highest level of proficiency in the sport and would allow them to lead their own expeditions. Each member brought a unique set of skills and backgrounds to the group, ranging from engineering and physics to a deep knowledge of the wilderness. Their journey began with high spirits and enthusiasm as they set out in the wilderness, loaded with equipment and supplies, ready to face the challenges of the harsh Russian winter. Together, they represented a microcosm of youth, ambition, and the relentless pursuit of achievement against the backdrop of the unforgiving beauty of the Ural Mountains. The early phase of the expedition saw the group departing from Ferdlosk, filled with anticipation for the adventure ahead. Their journey began with a train ride to Ivdel, a trip that spanned over 200 miles northward, marking the start of their venture into the remote wilderness. Upon arriving in Ivdel, they transitioned to a truck that took them further into the northern reaches to Vizhai, which served as the last inhabited settlement before the vast expanse of the Ural Mountains. Throughout this initial journey, the group engaged with locals, sharing moments of camaraderie and cultural exchange, showcasing their enthusiasm and openness to the world around them. It was during this early part of the expedition that Yuri Yudin, one of the ten original members, encountered health issues that forced him to make a difficult decision. Plagued by rheumatism and other health concerns, Yudin realized that continuing with the group would jeopardize both his well-being and the expedition's goals. With a heavy heart, he made the choice to turn back, leaving the rest of the group to proceed without him. This departure was a moment for both Yudin and his companions as they bid farewell, unaware of the tragedy that would soon befall the remaining nine members. Yudin's early return home left him as the sole survivor of the expedition, a twist of fate that would haunt him and color the legacy of the journey for years to come. After Yuri Yudin's departure, the remaining nine members of the expedition continued their journey into the heart of the Ural Mountains. Their path took them deep into the wilderness, a landscape blanketed in snow and marked by the stark beauty of winter. With determination, they followed a route that would lead them towards their destination, Artorton Mountain. Along the way, they meticulously documented their progress, capturing moments in photographs and diary entries, which later became invaluable records to their fateful journey. The group was well prepared, navigating through challenging terrain with the expertise and confidence born from their training and experience. As they pressed on, the weather began to worsen, presenting the hikers with new challenges. 
Despite the deteriorating conditions, the group made the decision to camp on the slope of Kolat Skal, a decision that has been scrutinized and debated by investigators and researchers in the years following the incident. This slope, which translates to Dead Mountain in the local Mansi language, offered a desolate yet compelling backdrop for their campsite. This choice to camp on the open slope rather than seek shelter in the nearby forested areas has puzzled many, suggesting that Dyatlov and his team might have reasons for doing so, possibly related to the expedition's goals or the unique challenges they sought to overcome. The establishment of their campsite on the eve of their disappearance was marked by routine preparations, setting up the tent, securing it against the elements, and settling in for the night. Unbeknownst to them, this camp would become the center of a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. The decision to camp there, in the face of worsening weather, reflects the group's adventurous spirit, but also foreshadows the tragic events that were soon to unfold. On the night of the incident, the group had settled into their tent on the slopes. They had seemingly prepared for a typical night in the wilderness. They had dinner together and worked on a mock newspaper they titled The Evening Atorton, a playful tradition of theirs that combined humor with updates on their expedition. This activity, captured in diary entries and photographs, depicted a group in good spirits, unaware of the horror that the night would bring. Sometime during the night, something triggered a sudden and frantic departure from their tent. The exact cause remains unknown but evidence suggests that it was urgent, forcing them to cut their way out from the inside, leaving behind footwear, clothing, and essential equipment. In temperatures plummeting to around minus 30 degrees Celsius or minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, they fled into the darkness, inadequately dressed for the severe cold. This desperate act hinted at an overwhelming threat or panic that prioritized immediate escape over survival against the elements. The search for the missing hikers began after they failed to return as scheduled, leading to the discovery of their abandoned campsite on February 26th by a search and rescue team. The scene that greeted the searchers was perplexing. The tent, partially collapsed and covered with a thin layer of snow, bore a large slash from the inside. Around it, scattered belongings and shoes painted a picture of a hasty departure. Further investigation revealed tracks leading away from the tent towards a nearby forest, suggesting that the group had descended the slope in a state of disarray. Initial findings of the investigation only deepened the mystery. The tent contained food supplies, indicating that the group had not planned to abandon it for long. Moreover, the orderly arrangement inside contrasted sharply with the chaotic escape, suggesting that the threat had been sudden and overwhelming. The discovery of the tent and the initial tracks laid the foundation for a mystery that has endured for decades, with the searchers' findings posing more questions and answers about the events leading up to that fateful night. The search for the missing hikers intensified in the days following the discovery of the abandoned tent, eventually leading to a series of grim and baffling findings. The first two bodies, those of Yuri Doroshenko and Georgi Krivoshenko, were discovered near the edge of the forest, dressed only in underwear, by a tree where they had seemingly attempted to start a fire. The tree branches above were broken, indicating an attempt to climb or look back towards the tent. Not far from them, three more bodies, Dyatlov, Zeneda Kolmogrova and Rustem Slobodin were found in intervals that suggested they were trying to return to the tent. Slobodin had a small fracture in his skull, but it was deemed not fatal, and hypothermia was concluded to be the cause of death for all five. The last four hikers were discovered in May in a ravine farther into the woods, which compounded the mystery. These bodies were better dressed, indicating they had taken clothes from those who had died first. Nikolai Thibo Brignols had significant skull damage, and both Ludmila Dubina and Semon Zolotorov had severe chest fractures, injuries too forceful to have been caused by a human being, according to the official autopsy report. Dubina was also missing her tongue, eyes, and part of her lips, a detail that has fueled much speculation. 
The injuries were perplexing, as there were no external trauma visible, only internal. Furthermore, some of the clothing on the bodies was found to be radioactive. Over the years, numerous theories have been proposed to explain the deaths of the Dyatlov group. Some suggest an avalanche forced them from their tent, though the tent's location and condition, along with the group's experienced members, have led many to question this theory. Others have speculated about military involvement, possibly a secret weapons test gone awry with the group accidentally witnessing something they shouldn't have. This theory is partially supported by reports of orange spheres in the sky by other hikers in the area at the time, which could indicate military or other activities. Indigenous peoples' involvement was considered and quickly dismissed due to the lack of evidence of any other footprints at the site. A more supernatural explanation was that of a Yeti attack. This is based on a bizarre photograph taken by one of the hikers that was found on a camera. Also, the unexplained nature of the injuries and the fact that some hikers fled the safety of their tent into the deadly conditions support this theory. Another theory was that of infrasound-induced panic caused by wind patterns. This suggested a cause for their irrational behavior, leading them to flee into the night. Despite the numerous investigations and theories, the Dyatlov Pass incident remains unsolved, with each explanation leaving unanswered questions. The combination of mysterious injuries, lack of external trauma, and strange circumstances surrounding the tent and bodies have kept the incident in the realm of the unexplained, a tragic story that continues to fascinate and horrify those who stumble upon it. The investigation into the incident has spawned a multitude of theories over the years, each attempting to make sense of the bewildering evidence and the tragic outcome. Initially, the Soviet authorities focused on natural causes, notably an avalanche, theorizing that the hikers had been forced to cut their way out of the tent to escape. However, critics of this theory point to the lack of significant avalanche debris at the site and the experienced hikers' questionable decision to camp on a slope known for its stability. Additionally, the orderly arrangement inside the tent and the location of the bodies, some of which were found up to a mile away, complicate this explanation. Military involvement has been another persistent theory, suggesting that the group might have stumbled upon a secret weapons test, possibly involving parachute mines or radiological experiments. This is partially supported by reports of orange spheres in the sky by other hikers in the area and the discovery of radioactivity on some of the clothing. However, the absence of concrete evidence, such as shrapnel or military documents, and the open discussion of the case in the Soviet times, albeit delayed, challenge the credibility of this explanation. The possibility of an attack by indigenous Mansi people was considered, given the group's location on a mountain considered to be sacred. Yet, the investigation quickly ruled this out due to lack of external injuries consistent with an attack and the peaceful relations between the hikers and the local tribes. Internal conflict among the group members has also been speculated, possibly driven by stress or romantic entanglements. However, the diaries and photographs from the expedition depict a cohesive and friendly group, making this theory unlikely. Furthermore, the severity of the injuries found on some of the bodies could not easily be attributed to human conflict. Explanations, such as Yeti attacks or extraterrestrial encounters, have been fueled by the bizarre circumstances surrounding the deaths, including the unexplained injuries and the radiological findings. While these theories capture the imagination, they lack empirical support and are generally dismissed by the scientific community. A more recent theory suggests that a phenomenon known as infrasound, caused by wind patterns around the mountain, could have induced panic attacks in the hikers, compelling them to flee the tent in a state of irrational fear. This theory attempts to account for the seemingly inexplicable behavior of the group, but like the others, it cannot fully explain all the evidence, such as the precise nature of the injuries and the subsequent actions of the hikers. The Dyatlov Pass incident has left a lasting mark on not only the families of the victims, but also the collective imagination of the world. For the families, the tragedy was a devastating loss compounded by a lack of closure. 
The absence of a conclusive explanation for the deaths of their loved ones has meant that the wound of loss has never fully healed, remaining open as speculation continues and the mystery deepens with each passing year. In popular culture, the Dyatlov Pass incident has evolved into a phenomenon that transcends its tragic origins, captivating the curiosity of millions around the globe. It has inspired books, films, documentaries, and countless discussions, each iteration attempting to unravel the mystery or explore the vast facets of human psychology and survival under extreme conditions. The story's unresolved nature adds to its allure, inviting amateur sleuths, conspiracy theorists, and scientific minds alike to ponder the possibilities and propose new theories. The ongoing fascination with the Dyatlov Pass is a testament to the enduring appeal of mysteries and the human desire to seek answers to the unexplained. It serves as a somber reminder of the limits of our understanding and the perpetual quest for knowledge in the face of the unknown. As the years turn into decades, the incident remains a topic of intrigue and speculation, its mysteries locked in the silent snows of the Ural Mountains, perhaps forever out of reach. This incident stands not only as a tragic event in history, but also as a symbol of the insatiable human quest for truth, reminding us of the complexities of our world and the mysteries that still lie waiting to be uncovered. The Dyatlov Pass incident is a story that has puzzled and intrigued us for decades. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey through one of history's most perplexing enigmas. Your curiosity and engagement are what make this community so special, and we're thrilled to have you part of it. If you found yourself captivated by the twists and turns of this incident, don't forget to hit that like button and share this video with fellow mystery enthusiasts. Also, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new and upcoming content. It's your support that helps us uncover and share these fascinating stories. And, of course, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel for more deep dives into the unknown. Your engagement is what keeps our community growing and thriving. For those of you who really enjoyed this video and want to go an extra mile in supporting the quest for mystery, consider leaving a super comment down below. Not only does this show your incredible support for the channel, but it also gives us valuable feedback on what mysteries you'd like us to explore next. Again, thank you for watching the entire video and for being an integral part of the community. Your enthusiasm for unraveling the mysteries of our world is what inspires us to keep seeking the truth, no matter how elusive it may be. Until next time, keep the curiosity alive, and remember, some mysteries remain unsolved, but the pursuit of answers is a journey always worth taking. In the chilling records of unsolved mysteries that dot the landscape of American criminal and missing persons cases, the story of the Yuba County Five carves a deep, unresolved furrow that has perplexed investigators, captivated the public's imagination, and tormented the hearts of families for decades. This case, often likened to America's own Dyatlov Pass incident due to its mysterious and tragic circumstances, revolves around the unexplained disappearance and subsequent death of five young men from Yuba City, California. In February 1978, a group known as the Yuba County Five, comprised Bill Sterling, Jack Hood, Ted Weyer, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias. These men, bound by a friendship that transcended their varying degrees of intellectual and psychiatric disabilities, embarked on a simple road trip to attend a college basketball game, an excursion that should have been a routine adventure among countless others. Yet, it unfurled into a perplexing odyssey with a tragic outcome that remains unresolved to this day. Bill Sterling and Jack Hewitt, both with mild intellectual disabilities, were known for their gentle natures and the simplicity with which they approached life. Ted Weyer and Jack Madruga, while facing their own challenges, were the anchors of the group, Weyer, with his big-hearted demeanor, and Madruga, an army veteran, provided a sense of direction and protection. Gary Mathias, the enigmatic figure of the group, was navigating the complexities of schizophrenia, but had found a semblance of stability through medication and his close-knit circle of friends. The significance of this case lies not only in the haunting mystery of their disappearance, 
but also in the societal implications it raises. Issues surrounding the treatment and perception of individuals with mental health and intellectual challenges, the enduring pain of families left without closure, and the myriad theories that have sprouted in attempts to explain the inexplicable. As we delve into the story of the Yuba County Five, we uncover a narrative laced with unanswered questions, a journey that started with joy and camaraderie but ended in a bewildering tragedy. This introduction sets the stage for a closer examination of the events leading up to their disappearance, the discovery of their fate, and the lingering shadows that hover over this case. Shadows that may never fully recede until the truth is unearthed. In the heart of California's Yuba County, five young men forged a friendship that was as profound as it was pure. Bill Sterling, Jack Hewitt, Ted Weir, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias. Each brought their unique personalities and challenges to the fabric of their group, bound together by a love for sports and an indelible sense of belonging. Their story is one of camaraderie and shared dreams, set against the backdrop of a mystery that would etch their names into the collective consciousness of a nation. Bill Sterling, 29, was known for his gentle spirit and a kindness that knew no bounds. Despite the intellectual challenges he faced daily, Bill's approach to life was characterized by an unyielding optimism. His friendship with the group provided him a platform to express himself freely, away from the societal labels that often defined him. Jack Hewitt, 24, was the quietest among them, carrying a shyness that was as much a part of him as his shadow. Yet, beneath this reserved exterior lay a depth of loyalty and affection for his friends. His developmental disabilities did nothing to diminish his zest for life, especially when shared with those who understood him best. Ed Weir, 32, stood as a figure of warmth and generosity. His large frame belied a gentleness and vulnerability that endeared him to many. Ted's challenges with learning did not deter him from enjoying the simple pleasures of life, chief among them the joy of sports and the company of his closest friends. Jack Madruga, 30, an army veteran, brought a sense of structure and protection. Despite facing his own learning difficulty, Jack's military background instilled in him a discipline and a sense of duty, particularly towards his friends. His leadership was subtle yet unmistakable, providing a guiding hand through their shared adventures. Gary Mathias, 25, the most complex character in this fellowship, navigated life with the shadow of schizophrenia looming over him. Yet, Gary's condition was managed with medication, allowing him moments of clarity and the ability to form meaningful relationships especially with his four friends. His military service, like Jack's, had ended in a psychiatric discharge, but it was in the camaraderie of the group that Gary found a semblance of peace and normalcy. The bond these five men shared was solidified through their collective passion for sports. Basketball was more than just a game to them. It was a lifeline that connected them to each other and to the world around them. They were more than just teammates on the Gateway Games a local team supported by a program for individuals with mental disabilities. They were brothers in arms, navigating the complexities of life together. Their shared experiences extended beyond the basketball court. They spent countless hours in each other's company, reveling in the simple joy of friendship that was unmarred by the judgments of the outside world. This was a safe haven where their disabilities did not define them, where they could be themselves unfettered and unafraid. As we delve deeper into their backgrounds, the mystery of their disappearance begins to unfold not just as a chilling enigma, but as a poignant reminder of the depth of their human spirit. These were not mere names in a case file. They were individuals with dreams, hopes, and an unbreakable bond that would tragically lead them into the heart of one of the most perplexing mysteries of the 20th century. On a cold evening in February 1978, a simple decision to attend a college basketball game set the stage for one of the most baffling disappearances in American history. The Yuba County Five, bound by their shared love for sports, embarked on what was supposed to be a joyous adventure, unaware it would be their last together. The game, held at California State University in Chico, offered them a chance to cheer for their favorite team, an opportunity they eagerly seized, driven by their enthusiasm and camaraderie. The plan was straightforward. They would drive from Yuba City to Chico, a journey of about 50 miles, 
to watch the game and return home the SME night. Jack Madruga, the owner of a turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego, would be behind the wheel, with his friends as eager passengers, anticipating an evening filled with excitement and sportive spirit. This decision, seemingly inconsequential at the time, became a pivotal moment in their lives and the lives of their families. The game ended on a high note for the group. With their team claiming victory, spirits were high as they left the stadium, basking in the glow of the wind and the pleasure of each other's company. Their next stop was a local convenience store in downtown Chico, where they stocked up on snacks and drinks for the ride back. It was a mundane activity, one they had performed countless times before. But this time, it served as the last confirmed sighting of the men. Surveillance and witness testimonies from the convenience store provided a snapshot of normalcy. Five friends, laughing and joking, seemingly without a care in the world. They were seen leaving the store, getting back into Madruga's car, and driving away into the night. This moment, frozen in time, marks the threshold beyond which the details of their journey become shadowed in mystery. The plan had been simple return home and prepare for a basketball tournament they were due to play in the next day, a tournament they were all looking forward to. They had even laid out their uniforms in anticipation, yet they never made it back. The route from Chico to Yuba City is straightforward, but for reasons unknown, their journey took an inexplicable and tragic detour. What prompted these five men to veer off their familiar path home remains one of the central mysteries of this case. The discovery of their abandoned car on a remote mountain road, far from their intended route, only deepens the puzzle. Inside the car were the snacks they had purchased, along with maps and other items that suggested a sudden and unexplained departure from the field. This chapter of their story raises more questions than it answers. What led them to abandon the safety and comfort of Madruga's car? What compelled them to venture into the frigid, unfamiliar wilderness that night? The answers to these questions remain elusive, shrouded in the silent testimony of the items left behind, the void left in their absence, as the evening of February 24, 1978 unfolded. The Yuba County Five's journey transitioned from an ordinary outing among friends to the prelude of an enduring mystery. This chapter retraces their steps, piecing together the sequence of events that led to their disappearance, focusing on the nuanced details of their last known hours. The drive to Chico was animated by the anticipation of the basketball game. The group, known for their passion for sports, viewed the game as more than just a match. It was an expression of their shared interests and a testament to their friendship. The route they took was familiar, one they had traveled before, with the landscapes of Northern California passing by as they discussed plays, players, and the excitement of the upcoming Special Olympics tournament they were slated to participate in. Upon their arrival at California State University, Chico, they merged with the crowd, their spirits buoyed by the electric atmosphere of GME night. Witnesses later reported seeing the group engaged and lively, cheering for their team with the uninhibited enthusiasm that characterizes true sports fans. This outing was a break from their routine, a night where the joy of the game and the camaraderie of friends converged. After the game, the group made a decision that would become a critical juncture in their story. They stopped at a local convenience store to buy snacks for the ride home. This moment, seemingly innocuous, became the last confirmed sighting of the men. The store, a typical establishment for a small town, was about to close for the night when the men entered, filling the quiet space with their laughter and light banter. The clerk, who later recounted the event to investigators, remembered the group for their jovial mood and the simplicity of their purchase, snacks, sodas, and milk. This detail, while mundane, paints a picture of normalcy, of friends concluding an evening out with a routine stop. However, hidden within this ordinary act was the precipice of their mysterious disappearance. In the wake of the Yuba County Five's disappearance, a chilling silence enveloped their family. Concern quickly escalated into alarm, prompting an immediate and anxious response. This chapter delves into the harrowing days following their absence, detailing the initial efforts to locate them and the perplexing discovery that deepened the mystery surrounding their fate. As dawn broke on February 25th, 
The absence of any sign from the men ignited concern among their family. Trusting their instincts that something was amiss, the families launched a fervent quest for answers. Calls were made to friends, hospitals, and jails, but no trace of the men was found. By the afternoon, unable to quell their growing dread, the families reported their loved ones missing to the authority. The law enforcement's initial response was swift, marked by a sense of urgency as the gravity of the situation became apparent. The report of five men, each with some degree of vulnerability due to their mental or psychiatric conditions, missing under mysterious circumstances, galvanized the community and law enforcement into action. The search operation began with an attempt to trace the men's last known movements. Investigators focused on their journey to Chico, the basketball game, and the subsequent visit to the convenience store. The route back to Yuba City, expected to be straightforward, offered no clues, leaving search teams grappling with the absence of any discernible trail. As days passed with no sign of the men, the search efforts expanded, growing in scale and desperation. Volunteers joined law enforcement officers, combing through the areas along the supposed route home, but every effort seemed to dissolve into the cold, February air, leaving no trace of the men. The first tangible clue emerged when a forest ranger reported an abandoned vehicle on a desolate mountain road in the Plumas National Forest. The car, identified as Jack Madrugas Mercury Montego, was located far off the expected route home. Its presence in such a remote area confounding and alarming in equal measure, the car's discovery shifted the focus of the search to the rugged terrain of the Plumas National Forest. The vehicle, found undamaged and locked, with some of the men's personal belongings inside, suggested a sudden and unexplained departure. The car's position, embedded in a snowbank, implied that the men had encountered difficulty. Yet the vehicle itself was operational, further deepening the mystery. The area around the car became the epicenter of the search effort. Teams scoured the forest, battling harsh weather conditions and challenging terrain in the hope of finding any trace of the men. As the search expanded, the mystery of why the car was abandoned in such a remote location and where the men could have gone from there loomed large over the investigation. The discovery of Madruga's car opened a new chapter in the search for the Yuba County Five, transforming the operation from a search for missing persons to an investigation to a baffling disappearance that defied logical explanation. The car, both a clue and a symbol of the mystery, marked the beginning of a search that would stretch on haunted by the unanswered questions it represents. In this chapter, the initial response to the Yuba County Five's disappearance and the discovery of Madruga's car are chronicled not just as the beginning of a search operation, but as the onset of a profound mystery. A mystery that, from the moment Madruga's car was found, would capture the attention and imagination of all who heard it, becoming a haunting narrative of loss, uncertainty, and the enduring quest for answers in the vast, silent forests of Northern California. The discovery of Jack Madruga's car, abandoned, in the remote wilderness of Plumas National Forest, marked a pivotal moment in the search for the Yuba County Five. This chapter explores the intensification of search efforts that followed, the myriad challenges faced by the search team, and the burgeoning theories that attempted to explain the inexplicable abandonment car. In the days following the car's discovery, Search efforts were dramatically intensified. The rugged and snow-laden landscape of Plumas National Forest presented a formidable challenge, yet search teams, comprising both professional search and rescue personnel and volunteers, were undeterred. They combed through dense forestation, navigated steep terrain, and braved the biting cold, driven by the hope of finding the missing men alive. The search operation was extensive involving helicopters for aerial surveillance, ground teams equipped with dogs, and even snowcats to traverse the deep snow. Despite these efforts, the search yielded no immediate result, deepening the aura of mystery surrounding the disappearance. The forest, vast and silent, seemed to have swallowed any trace of the men. The search was fraught with challenge, both natural and logistical. The winter weather was particularly harsh, with new snowfall covering any potential tracks or clues, the forest's dense underbrush and rugged terrain hampered the ground teams, 
how the vastness of the area made the search akin to finding a needle in a haystack. Furthermore, the psychological toll on the search teams and the families of the missing men was significant. Each day without a discovery was a blow to hope, yet the uncertainty fueled a relentless drive to continue the search. The community rallied. The shadow of despair loomed large as the possibility of never finding the men became an ever more tangible reality. The perplexing circumstances of the car's abandonment fueled widespread speculation and theory. One prevailing theory posited that the men had become disoriented, possibly due to the dense fog and dark, leading them to inadvertently drive up the mountain road. Yet, this theory was challenged when the car was found operational and unstuck from the snow suggesting that the man had voluntarily abandoned them. Another theory suggested foul play, speculating that the men may have been forced or coerced into leaving the car by an unknown. However, there was no concrete evidence to support them, and the theory raised more questions than answers. A third theory considered the possibility of an intentional detour gone awry, perhaps an adventurous impulse to explore the forest, or an attempt to take a short Yet, Given the men's known characteristics and the conditions that night, this seemed out of character and unlikely. As the search continued with no sign of the men, these theories remained speculative, each attempting to piece together the puzzle of the car's abandonment. The mystery only deepened as the search yielded no clues to their whereabouts, leaving investigators and the community grappling with the baffling disappearance of the Yuba County. The search for the Yuba County Five marked by the abandoned car in the Plumas National Forest, became a story of human resilience in the face of the unknown. The community's determination to find the men, the challenges faced by the search team, and the speculative theories all converged to deepen the mystery surrounding their disappearance. As the days turned into weeks, the absence of any concrete evidence or leads only served to underscore the profound enigma at the heart of this case a mystery that resonated far beyond the boundaries of the forest and into the collective consciousness of all who followed their story. As spring turned into early summer, the relentless snows that had blanketed the Plumas National Forest began to recede, revealing the grim secrets it had concealed. The discovery of Theodore Weyer's body in a remote forest service cabin, and later the remains of Madruga, Sterling, and Huit brought a tragic turn to the search for the Yuba County Five. Yet, the whereabouts of Gary Mathias remained shrouded in uncertainty, deepening the heartache. The discovery of Theodore Weyer's body inside a locked and desolate Forest Service cabin, about 19.4 miles from where the car had been abandoned, was a harrowing development. Weyer was found lying on a bed, his body emaciated and showing signs of severe starvation and hypothermia. What was particularly perplexing was the presence of food and heating supplies in the cabin that had not been utilized. Matches, books, and wooden furniture could have been used to start a fire in the cabin's fireplace, yet there was no evidence that any attempt had been made. Similarly, a storage locker outside the cabin contained a substantial amount of dehydrated food sufficient to sustain all five men for a year, untouched. In the days following the grim discovery of Weiher's body, search teams uncovered the remains of Jack Madruga and William Sterling several miles from the cabin, on opposite sides of the road leading back towards the direction of their abandoned car. The condition of their bodies suggested that they had succumbed to hypothermia, with Madruga found with his keys still in his pocket, adding a layer of melancholy to the mystery. Why had he not attempted to return to the car, which was found to be operational? Jack Huitt's remains were found in close proximity to the cabin, identified by a spine and a pair of shoes scattered beneath a manzanita bush, with his skull located some distance away. The discovery of Huitt's remains so near to the cabin, yet so far from his companions, suggested a fragmented and desperate attempt by the group to find shelter or help. Amidst the sorrowful revelations came the unsettling realization that Gary Mathias was nowhere to be found. Despite exhaustive searches of the area surrounding the cabin and the routes leading to and from the location where the car had been discovered, no trace of Matthias could be on her. His disappearance remained a haunting question mark at the heart of the case. Matthias's history of mental health issues and his survival skills 
home during his time in the military led to a myriad of theories regarding his fate. Could he have wandered off into the wilderness, disoriented and alone, or might he have found help? His whereabouts kept secret for reasons unknown. The discoveries in the Plumas National Forest brought a somber resolution to some aspects of Yuba County 5's disappearance, but also underscored the profound mystery and tragedy of the case. The conditions in which Wire was found, the scattered remains of Madruga, Sterling, and Huet, and the enigmatic absence of Gary Mathias painted a picture of confusion, desperation, and unanswerable questions. As families grieved and communities mourned, the search for answers continued, albeit with the heavy realization that some secrets of the forest might remain forever untold. The Yuba County Five had ventured into the night with the promise of a basketball game and companionship, only to meet with a fate that was as heartrending as it was incomprehensible. The memory of their disappearance and the subsequent discoveries remain a poignant reminder of the fragility of life and the impenetrable mysteries that can lie just beyond the edge of the familiar. The perplexing disappearance of the Yuba County Five not only unleashed a wave of sorrow but also sparked an intense debate over what could have led to such a tragic outcome. In the months following the discovery of the bodies, several eyewitness accounts and theories emerged, each adding layers of complexity to an already baffling. One of the most chilling accounts came from Joseph Sean a man who claimed to have been in the vicinity of the Mercury Montego on the night the men disappeared. Charles reported that, while stranded with his own vehicle, he witnessed a group of people, including what he believed to be the missing men, near his location. His calls for help were met with silence as the group extinguished their lights and vanished into the dark. This encounter, peculiar and unsettling, suggested that the men might have been disoriented or in a state of panic possibly contributing to their tragic decision. Adding to the mystery was a report from a woman in Brownsville who claimed to have seen four of the men in a red pickup truck a considerable distance from where their car was found. This sighting raised questions about their movements after the basketball game and whether they had encountered someone who led them astray or provided transportation, intentionally or not, into the unfamiliar terrain of the Plumas National Forest. The accumulation of eyewitness accounts opened the floodgates to various theories attempting to make sense of the fragmented narrative. One prevalent theory suggested an accidental detour prompted by a wrong turn or misjudgment, leading the group into the forest. This theory contemplates the possibility of the men becoming hopelessly lost, with the worsening weather and their lack of survival skills culminating in tragedy. Conversely, the theory of foul play considered the possibility that the men were coerced or manipulated into leaving the safety of their vehicle, perhaps under the threat of violence. This line of thought is partially supported by the condition in which Madruga's car was found, abandoned yet functional, hinting at an abrupt and unexplained departure. Mental health crises also emerged as a focal point in unraveling the mystery. Gary Mathias diagnosed schizophrenia coupled with the stress of an unforeseen and frightening situation, might have exacerbated the group's collective panic, leading to disorganized and irrational decisions. The isolation and harsh conditions of the poor likely compounded their distress, resulting in the tragic outcomes discovered months later. Each theory, while offering potential explanations, also underscored the profound tragedy of the Yuba County Five. The accounts of Joseph Shans and the witness in Brownsville painted a picture of a night fraught with confusion and fear. Whether the men's fate was the result of a tragic misadventure, an encounter with malevolent forces, or a culmination of mental health challenges exacerbated by the elements, remains a subject of speculation. The disappearance of the Yuba County Five not only unveiled a physical mystery, but also cast the spotlight on the intersection of mental health intellectual disabilities, and societal perception. The case intricately intertwines the personal struggles of the individuals with broader themes of vulnerability, stigma, and the often misunderstood nature. At the heart of this mystery are five men, each with their unique battles. Gary Mathias, schizophrenia, alongside the mild intellectual disabilities of Bill Sterling and Jack Hewitt and the learning difficulties faced by Ted Weiher and Jack Madrug played a critical role in the plan. 
These conditions possibly influence their decision-making process, susceptibility to stress and panic, and their capability to navigate the unexpected and daunting situation they found themselves in. The mental and intellectual challenges faced by the group could have exacerbated their vulnerability, confronted with the harsh and un the psychological aspect of their journey, seemingly innocuous basketball game outing to their tragic end, is complex. It raises questions about how their mental and intellectual capacities might have influenced their actions after becoming disoriented or flawed. Could panic have set in more swiftly? Did their conditions make them more susceptible to trusting the wrong individuals, or were they less likely to assess the risks accurately of venturing into the unknown? The societal response to the disappearance and the subsequent revelations about the men's mental health and intellectual disabilities spotlighted the stigma often associated with such conditions. Media coverage and public discourse sometimes veered towards sensationalism, with less focus on understanding the nuanced challenges faced by those with mental health issues and intellectual disabilities. This case serves as a poignant reminder of the critical need for sensitivity and awareness in discussing handling matters involving mental health. Moreover, the case sheds light on the systemic failures and providing adequate support and safety nets for individuals with such conditions. The fact that these men were able to embark on an ill-fated journey with little oversight or preparation underscores the broader issues of societal neglect and the underestimation of the risks they face due to their vulnerability. The Yuba County 5 case prompts a reflective examination of how society perceives and supports individuals with mental health and intellectual challenges. It underscores the importance of compassionate understanding and the need for inclusive strategies that ensure the safety and well-being of all community members, especially the most vulnerable. In the years following the tragedy, there has been a gradual shift towards a more informed and empathetic approach to mental health and intellectual disabilities. Advocacy and awareness campaigns have worked tirelessly to dismantle the stigma and advocate for policies that prioritize mental health services, support systems, and education. The legacy of the Yuba County Five, in its tragic complexity, continues to inform these efforts, serving as a stark reminder of the work that remains to be done in understanding the psychological landscape of the Yuba County Five case reveals a tapestry of human vulnerability, the critical importance of mental health awareness and the societal responsibility to foster an environment where all individuals, regardless of their mental or intellectual challenges. First, the investigation into the disappearance of the Yuba County Five was fraught with complexities from the onset. Law enforcement agencies faced a multitude of challenges, ranging from the harsh environmental conditions to the unconventional methods employed in the hopes of uncovering the truth behind the men's fateful journey. The role of law enforcement search and investigation was pivotal, yet hampered by several significant hurdles. The initial search efforts were quickly complicated by the rugged terrain of the Plumas National Forest and the onset of severe winter weather conditions. The snow-covered landscape and dropping temperatures made the search for the five men not just difficult, but perilous for the rescuers. The discovery of Jack Madruga's car, abandoned and stuck in the snow, offered a glimmer of hope and a new clue to their potential whereabouts, but also deepened the mystery of their disappearance. The car's location, far from their intended route, and in a remote area unfamiliar to the men, perplexed investigators and search teams. Compounding the physical challenges were the logistical issues of coordinating a search across a vast, inhospitable area. Law enforcement agencies had to balance the urgency of finding the men with the safety of the search parties. Resources were stretched thin, as the search extended over days, then weeks, with the melting snow of spring revealing only more questions. In an era when traditional investigative methods seemed to reach their limits, the families of the missing men and, at times, the investigators themselves turned to psychics and other unconventional methods in a desperate bid for answers. The involvement of psychics in the investigation was a testament to the profound sense of helplessness and frustration felt by the families and the community. Psychics offered theories that ranged from plausible to the fantastical, suggesting locations where the men might be found, 
or providing cryptic clues about their fate. While these efforts were well-intentioned, they often led to wild goose chases, draining resources and diverting attention. The reliance on psychics also highlighted the limitations and challenges faced by law enforcement in dealing with cases that defy easy explanation. The psychological toll on the families and the investigators was palpable, as each new theory brought hope, only to be dashed by the lack of tangible results. The use of unconventional methods, while a reflection of the desperation and determination to find the men, ultimately underscored the complexities and limitations of the investigation. The disappearance of the Yuba County Five left a void in the hearts of their families, a void that decades of uncertainty and unanswered questions have only deepened. The emotional toll exacted on the families of Bill Sterling, Jack Huitt, Ed Weyer, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias is a testament to the enduring pain of not knowing the fate of loved ones. This chapter delves into their relentless quest for answers, a journey marked by hope, despair, and the unwavering desire for closure. Each day following the disappearance, the families oscillated between hope and despair. Initially, there was hope that the men would be found alive. Perhaps having taken shelter from the cold or lost in the vast wilderness of the Plumas National Forest. However, as days turned into weeks, and the only discoveries were more questions, that hope began to wane. The eventual finding of four of the men's bodies brought a devastating kind of clarity to some families, while the absence of Gary Mathias only compounded the mystery and prolonged the agony for his family. The emotional impact of such a prolonged period of uncertainty cannot be overstated. Birthdays, holidays, and family gatherings became poignant reminders of the absence of their loved ones. Parents aged, not only carrying the usual burdens of time, but also the heavy, unresolved grief for their sons. Siblings found themselves navigating life's milestones without their brothers, their joy in these moments forever tinged with sadness. Driven by a need for answers, and a desire to understand what had happened to their loved ones. The families embarked on their own investigations. They reached out to law enforcement, engaged private investigators, and even consulted psychics. The families also became advocates, not just for their own lost loved ones, but for improvements in how missing persons' cases are handled. They challenged law enforcement agencies to keep searching, to keep investigating, and to never let the case go cold. Their living rooms became makeshift command centers filled with files and maps, a testament to their determination to find answers. The broader community's response was mixed, with an outpouring of support for the families in some quarters and, in others, a morbid fascination with the mystery. The families navigated the delicate balance of welcoming attention that could lead to new information while also protecting the dignity and memory of their loved ones from sensationalism. They endured the spread of unfounded rumors and speculative theories, each new story a double-edged sword that could potentially lead to answers but also add to their anguish. For the families of the Yuba County Five, the quest for closure is an ongoing journey. Closure, in this context, is multifaceted, encompassing not just the need for answers about what happened on that fateful night but also the need to process and accept the loss to find a way to remember and honor their loved ones. This somehow, the disappearance of the Yuba County Five has left an indelible mark on the community of Yuba County, the wider public, and the annals of true crime history. Over the years, this case has transcended its initial status as a local mystery to become a subject of national injury, compelling a broader audience to grapple with its complexities and unanswered questions. This chapter explores the profound cultural impact of this case and the enduring legacy of the men who vanished under circumstances as mystifying as they were tragic. In the immediate aftermath of the disappearance, the community of Yuba County was engulfed in a wave of shock and empathy. Locals, who had perhaps once felt insulated from the type of mysteries that captured national headlines, found themselves at the center of a perplexing case that defied explanation. The search efforts brought together volunteers, law enforcement, and the families in a united front of concern and determination. Local businesses, schools, and churches became hubs of activity related to the search, reflecting a community galvanized by a shared sense of loss and purpose. As years passed, 
the case became a somber part of the local lore, a reminder of the fragility of life and the mysteries that can lurk in the familiar landscapes of home. The legacy of the Yuba County Five served to heighten community awareness about mental health, the challenges faced by individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and the importance of support systems for those navigating these challenges. Beyond Yuba County, the disappearance of the five men captured the imagination of the wider public, becoming a fixture in the true crime genre. The case's multiple layers of mystery, from the inexplicable journey to the remote location of the car to the haunting discoveries months later, offered fertile ground for speculation, discussion, and investigation among amateur sleuths, journalists, and authors alike. In the era of digital media, the story of the Yuba County Five has found new life in online forums, podcasts, and documentaries, reaching audiences far removed from the event's 1978 origin. This sustained interest underscores the universal human fascination with the unknown and the desire to solve mysteries that seem to defy logic. The Yuba County Five has cemented its place in the history of true crime as a case that challenges our understanding of human behavior, survival, and tragedy. It stands as a poignant reminder of the limits of investigative techniques and the enduring pain of unresolved loss. The case has contributed to discussions on how missing persons cases, especially those involving adults with disabilities, are handled by law enforcement and reported by the media. Moreover, the legacy of the Yuba County Five has inspired a deeper consideration of the narratives we construct around those who disappear and the biases that can influence these narratives. It has prompted a reevaluation of the importance of empathy, respect, and dignity in the investigation of such cases, reminding us that at the heart of every mystery, a human being. As time marches on, the story of the Yuba County Five continues to be examined through the lens of new evidence, insights, and the evolving understanding of human behavior under extreme conditions. This chapter delves into a comprehensive analysis of the most plausible theories surrounding the disappearance, taking into account the impact of subsequent revelations and shifts in perspective that have emerged over the years. Among the myriad theories that have been proposed, a few stand out for their logical coherence and the weight of evidence, or the lack thereof, that supports them. These include the possibility of an accidental detour leading to a tragic sequence of events, the potential influence of mental health crises, and the specter of foul play or coercion by an accidental detour and survival missteps. This theory posits that the group, possibly disoriented by the darkness and unfamiliar roads, took a wrong turn and led them into the depths of the Plumas National Forest. Once stranded, their survival decisions, potentially impaired by panic, hold, and cognitive disabilities, led to the tragic outcome. Recent discussions have revisited this theory with a focus on the psychology of group dynamics under stress, suggesting that a follow-the-leader mentality might have exacerbated mental health crises. The mental health of Gary Mathias, in particular, has been a focal point of speculation. With his history of schizophrenia, questions linger about the role his condition might have played in the events of that night. However, Newer interpretations have cautioned against oversimplifying the influence of Matthias's mental health, advocating for a more nuanced understanding that considers the supportive dynamics among the group and Matthias's reportedly stable condition before the incident. Foul play. The absence of conclusive evidence has not deterred theories of foul play, including the possibility of the group encountering someone with malicious intent. Recent re-examinations have sought to identify any overlooked evidence or patterns that might hint at such an encounter, although definitive proof remains elusive. The theory of an external threat is further complicated by the lack of physical evidence indicating violence or coercion. Over the years, occasional discoveries and advances in forensic technology have prompted re-evaluations of the case. For instance, the analysis of the car's location and condition using modern forensic methods, has offered fresh perspectives on how and why the vehicle ended up where it did. Similarly, interviews with individuals who knew the men, or with new witnesses coming forward, have occasionally provided new leads, 
psychological and sociological research into how individuals with intellectual disabilities react in emergency situations has also enriched the discussion. Such insights suggest that the men's disabilities might have influenced their responses to being lost and cold, potentially leading to the tragic decision. Moreover, the advent of digital media and online sleuthing communities has brought renewed attention to the case, with amateur detectives combing through old evidence and proposing new angles. While this has not yet solved the mystery, it has kept the conversation alive, increasing the chances that new evidence might one day emerge. In revisiting these theories, it becomes clear that the mystery of the Yuba County Five is as complex as it is heartbreaking. Each theory offers a lens through which to view the events, yet none can fully account for all the known facts. The intersection of mental health issues, the challenges posed by the harsh environment, and the mystery surrounding their final decisions create a puzzle that has yet to be solved. Decades have passed since the disappearance of Bill Sterling, Jack Huet, Ted Weyer, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias. Yet the veil of mystery that envelops their fateful journey into the Plumas National Forest has not lifted. Despite exhaustive investigations, numerous theories, and the advent of advanced forensic technologies, the precise sequence of events that led to their tragic end remains elusive. This enduring mystery serves as a stark reminder of the limits of our understanding and the unpredictable nature of human existence. The quest for answers has never waned, driven by a collective yearning for truth and a resolution that might bring peace to the bereaved family. Law enforcement agencies, amateur detectives, and online communities continue to dissect the available evidence, propose new theories, and explore every conceivable angle in the hope of uncovering new leads. This tireless search for truth underscores the profound impact of the case on the public consciousness and the inherent human desire for justice. The Yuba County Five case occupies a unique position in the catalog of unsolved mysteries, distinguished not only by the peculiar circumstances of the disappearance, but also by the deep emotional resonance it evokes. It challenges our perceptions of safety, friendship, and the fragility of life, inviting introspection and empathy. As such, it stands as a testament to the enduring fascination with the unknown and the complexities of the human condition. As we reflect upon the lives of the Yuba County Five, we honor their memory not as mere subjects of a mystery, but as individuals who lived, loved, and left an indelible mark for those who knew. Each man brought joy, laughter, and love to their families and friends, and their absence has left a void that can never be filled. The ongoing quest for answers transcends the need for closure it is a testament to the enduring love of their families and the collective empathy of a community united in grief and hope. As the years pass, the memory of Bill, Jack, Ed, Jack, and Gary continues to inspire a relentless pursuit of truth, driven by the hope that one day, the mystery will be solved and peace will be restored to their love. In their memory, and in the spirit of that hope, we continue to seek answers, to question the shadows and to strive for a resolution that may, at last, bring peace to the haunting legacy of the Yuba County Five. Their story is a poignant reminder of the bonds of friendship, the resilience of families in the face of unimaginable loss, and the unyielding human spirit's quest for answers in the face of enduring mysteries.